Thank you very much, Ellie. Um, morning, all. Um, thanks to Tabitha and Charlie for bringing together this remarkable event. Um, so today, uh, really, I don't think we'd be having this level of diverse debate if it wasn't for this extraordinary political engagement we've pulled together. I can see many friends of the community and the audience here today from the APPG and the House of Lords Select Committee. Um, over the last two years, there's been a couple of people I'd like to introduce shortly that, um, let me just give you some stats, they've taken 223 pieces of written evidence, 57 witnesses giving oral evidence, and it's produced a 181-page report, I've read every single word of this, with 74 recommendations. Um, and it was launched a great fanfare in March by the Sun newspaper, quote, boffins urged to prevent fibbing robots from staging a Terminator-style apocalypse otherwise known as the House of Lords Select Committee Review on AI. So I'll spare you the long biography. We literally have 39 minutes to get through this. Um, so first of all, can I please welcome two people who have done some great work here, Baroness Olly Grender and Lord Tim Clement-Jones. Rob, thank you very much indeed. Now, I'm assuming that this is the uh, gizmo I need to, uh, we need to uh, uh, use. Um, we hope, Ollie and I hope, this is going to be a relatively painless uh, uh, way of digesting the 181 pages, 74 recommendations. So we're going to go at some speed, um, and we hope that if uh, we need to unpack some of those uh, issues, uh, Rob will be interrogating us uh, uh, cruelly uh, afterwards. So uh, we'll see how it, how it goes and whether we manage to cover the ground uh, with sufficient um, speed. Um, now, uh, first of all, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, what we have to uh, uh, do is uh, take a position. And I think the committee uh, uh, were pretty unanimous, actually, uh, but we weren't uh, amongst the pessimists. We weren't amongst the optimists. Uh, uh, and as you can see, uh, Elon Musk has had quite a lot to say on this, being uh, that AI is more dangerous than nuclear weapons and so on. And people like uh, 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 Myron, uh, Nathan Myvold and, and Mark Zuckerberg and so on have been on the equal optimistic side uh, of the fence. We thought that we, uh, I think, have adopted a much more realistic position. Um, and I rather liked uh, what uh, 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 Sundar Pichai had to say uh, about it in terms of uh, AI is going to become fundamental. It's going to be like a utility. It's going to be in every sector. Uh, and that, we thought, uh, was the best characterization. Now, of course, uh, AI has been pretty high on the UK agenda for some period of time. The Prime Minister gave a speech at Davos, but there have been a whole series of reports uh, last year. We had the, um, uh, 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 the uh, uh, reports uh, about industrial strategy, um, uh, and of course, we've recently had uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, sector deal uh, for AI, uh, which is part of the industrial strategy, only published about a few weeks ago. Um, and the EU itself um, has uh, done quite a lot in this area. They published a paper a few weeks ago as well, shortly after our report on AI in Europe, coming, I'm glad to say, to many of the same conclusions. Uh, but first of all, let's just talk about what the committee brief was all around. Um, uh, it uh, started on the 29th of June uh, last year, uh, and we were appointed to consider the economic, ethical, and social implications of advances in artificial intelligence. So not uh, a particularly narrow uh, uh, field of uh, inquiry, as you can see. Uh, what we were being asked to do was a pretty comprehensive uh, inquiry into the public policy implications of AI. And we asked ourselves a number of really uh, fundamental questions. How does it affect people in their everyday lives? Uh, what are the potential opportunities? Uh, what are the possible risks? Um, because obviously with opportunities come risks. Uh, how should the public be engaged uh, uh, with in a responsible manner about AI? And I think at the back of our minds was very much how to avoid the GM foods issue uh, uh, in the way that the, the, the lack of good public communication and the lack of public trust meant that people uh, were pretty, uh, uh, they abreacted effectively against the whole uh, GM foods agenda. And then finally, what are the ethical issues presented by the development and use of artificial intelligence? And one of the toughest things we had to do at the beginning was, of course, define what is AI for the purpose of our committee. I'm sure you all have your very own definitions, but what we plumbed for in the end came out of the industrial strategy, 
and it was that technologies with the ability to perform tasks that would otherwise require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, and language translation. But we had an addition, given the changes particularly uh, in machine learning that have come up over the recent times, and so we added in um, that uh, today uh, AI systems usually have the capacity to learn or adapt to new experience or stimuli. So that was the definition that we stuck to, clung to, I would say, um, throughout uh, the production of our report. Of course, uh, what we quickly realised was as soon as it is AI uh, and as soon as it's up and running and working, and all of you will be familiar with this, um, then nobody calls it AI anymore and it just becomes part of your routine. And I would uh, refer you to the report, which has a lovely day in the life of, uh, where you're woken up uh, by, uh, uh, you know, kind of your smartphone, which has recognised your sleep patterns and when it's best to wake you up. Uh, you then ask your personal device what the news is and it is delivered to you in a way tailored to your particular interests. Your child, apparently, and this is in a fantasy world and certainly not in my household, is meanwhile revising on an app that's deliberately designed uh, for him, uh, brackets, not using some kind of game on his smartphone. Um, and then as you drive to work, uh, the route is worked out for you already by predictive algorithms uh, that understand the traffic flow. And you get a call from your bank which says that uh, your card has been frauded because they've worked out it isn't you who would buy that £4,000 design address in Paris. Um, and as you go home and wind down for the day, um, your car once again understands that you need relaxing music on the way home and your TV has already worked out what it would be nice for you and your partner to watch that evening. So these things are already with us, uh, even though they are AI, but we um, use them as standard. So what were the headlines of the report? Before we get to the guts of the report, just a few headlines. Uh, the UK is in a strong position to be a world leader in the development of artificial intelligence. And this position, coupled with the wider adoption of AI, could deliver a major boost for the uh, economy uh, for years to come. And of course, that kind of conclusion is very much dependent on, uh, uh, I would say, uh, many of our recommendations uh, being accepted going forward. So it is somewhat conditional in the way uh, that it is put. Um, and then, uh, 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 of course, the reason for that is, and it's, um, uh, you know, we're not just being Pollyanna-ish about the, uh, uh, the prospects for the UK. It is, of course, because we've already got some leading AI developers. We've got a dynamic academic research culture in so many centres. And the evidence we had from Oxford, from Cambridge, from London, uh, right around the country was incredibly impressive. Uh, we've got a vigorous startup ecosystem. We go on to talk about it not being so vigorous when it comes to growth companies. And then, of course, we have a clustering effect in London, particularly of legal, ethical, financial, uh, and linguistic strengths. But as I think you're, you all know, because you're in this room and you've come with the title of the uh, discussion, AI is not without its own risks. Uh, and it's really important that ethics is considered as central to development and use. And what we did find in many cases from the evidence that we took is that ethics can sometimes be an add-on rather than embedded in everything around AI. And we believe that it's critical that it is embedded. So as, as Tim already said, GM Foods is a very good learning experience on that about building public trust. AI will not be usable if it doesn't have the public behind it uh, and that trust is absolutely essential and in order to build trust, there needs to be an understanding of the ethics behind it. Um, we did look at the possibilities of a world without work and we did, and the prospects of super intelligent machines, we felt we are not at that point yet. However, there are pressing issues which ethics needs to deal with uh, around the mundane uh, more mundane, slightly more mundane use of AI, which is already present um, for society. And we believe that's where government comes in and where it's particularly important for policy makers. And we took the lessons in particular from the HFEA, the Human Fertilization and Embryology um, Authority, which was set up at the beginning of the use of IVF. And we saw that as a very interesting model 
of staying ahead of science in a way, but drawing some lines, uh, ethical lines in the sand. So we need to put ethics at the centre of AI's development and use. Um, we need to shape AI positively for the public's benefit. And we felt there was an opportunity, particularly for us in the UK, to lead the international community in AI's ethical development, partly because of the legal base that we have here in the UK, um, because of the academic, the wealth of academia in this area, and of course, um, the, you know, kind of where it all started with Turing. Um, so whilst the precise impact of AI across society, politics, and the economy remains uncertain, it is generally not disputed that it will have some effect on all three, and that we have a unique opportunity to forge a distinctive role. So uh, let's just unpack a few of the key themes briefly. Um, uh, first of all, UK leadership in the development and use of AI, inclusion and diversity being absolutely vital in all of this, equipping people for the future, control over data, uh, and an ethical framework. Um, for AI. Now, I'm not going to go uh, massively into the whole area of opportunities through leadership. Uh, we certainly took the view that we couldn't take it for granted. And actually, if you look at the recent Economist uh, report, uh, we are somewhere, I think, like eighth in the world uh, in the ranking. So, you know, we can't take for granted the fact that we can perform a leadership role, but we should be taking opportunities in order to make sure that we build on that and we develop our capabilities. So, targeted government procurement, we need a proper national policy framework, uh, uh, and we need, uh, uh, particularly in certain areas like healthcare, uh, some imagination as to how we can develop AI uh, for those kinds of uses. Uh, and I'd add education to that as well, uh, quite honestly. And then, of course, in the whole area of, uh, of growth and startups and so on, we've got to harness, uh, uh, if you like, the, 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 the fact that London is a great source of capital, uh, but it is not perfect. It is not as good as Silicon Valley. Uh, uh, it may be uh, we have a good startup culture now, but we need growth funds. We need uh, the British Business Bank to step up to the plate and so on. And there are many other... Uh, uh, aspects of this as well. Uh, and then the whole question of inclusion and diversity. Um, and uh, I think the thing that I would particularly uh, want to highlight, and Ollie is going to give an illustration of this, is that in the design of AI and algorithms in particular, we've got to be aware of the potential for bias and prejudice. So um, I th there's an excellent quote in our report from Olivia Theroux, which is um, from Head of Tech Open Data Institute. And I think it sums it up very, very well. We take bias, which in certain forms is what we call culture, put it in a black box and crystallize it forever. That is where we have a problem. We have even more of a problem when we think that that black box has the truth and we follow it blindly and we say, the computer says no, that is the problem. And already we're seeing issues where AI is in use, say, in the penal system in the US and is making highly biased uh, judgments. So it is critical that this is dealt with and it falls to government to deal with this area. So um, a particular aspect of this is that we must ensure that our use of AI doesn't inadvertently use bias. And the report... Um, introduce some recommendations on this. One particular favourite of mine is that we set up um, a challenge fund. The government has been setting up lots of challenge funds in all sorts of areas, but to develop algorithms um, that will um, search into bias, because I think we accept that it's very difficult for those of you who are in the marketplace uh, to pay lots and lots of attention to this, even though we think you should, but government needs to give it an appropriate push. Um, so that's why we would call for things like approaches to the auditing of data sets uh, and also encourage greater diversity in the training and recruitment of AI specialists. We also need to equip people for the future. Um, so um, there are significant implications that lie ahead and all the evidence that came to us suggested this for the way in which society lives and works. Um, there will be digital disruption in the jobs market. Many jobs will be enhanced by AI, but many will disappear 
and many new, as yet, unknown jobs. And that is where people need to acquire a lifelong understanding of digital literacy. But digital literacy on its own is not enough. Our children need to have an ability to have critical thinking from an early stage. They have all the information at their fingertips. What they now need is that ability to question that information. Uh, and that is why, you know, even at key stage one in primary schools, when children who now, from the curriculum, and the curriculum is quite good on this, are learning to remove bugs from coding, they also need to have all the humanities uh, lessons as well, so they can ask, so that they can use their knowledge of history to question things, so they can use their knowledge of philosophy and religion to question things as well. Now, of course, um, we've got a bit of a window of opportunity in terms of public uh, trust. Um, we do need to be very cognizant about the retraining agenda, about the skilling agenda. But as I say, uh, we do have a bit of a window because it's, interestingly enough, the public is not yet uh, 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 absolutely worried uh, uh, about the future in terms of job losses and so on. And that is an opportunity because it allows at least some form of public discourse about what we need to do. Um, and uh, there may be other polls, and I think uh, uh, one or two of you have um, uh, raised those with me in the past. Uh, I can see uh, a wave in the front row. Um, but that was the best uh, data that we had at the time that we did the report. Um, and there may be the window is beginning to close uh, as we get this public narrative that Rob was talking about in terms of Terminator robots uh, and so on. But we <laughs> hope that with debate and with uh, reskilling uh, uh, being absolutely uh, front and centre, uh, that we don't find ourselves in that situation. Now, uh, the next area uh, we looked at um, was the control over personal data. And of course, that has been raised um, to a much greater degree of public interest uh, post the Cambridge Analytica scandal, uh, 87 million personal records of, of Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we've got to make sure that the ways in which data is gathered and accessed uh, uh, is changed. Um, so that everybody has fair and reasonable access to the data uh, and they know that uh, they can protect their privacy and personal agency at the same time. Uh, now, of course, uh, people might say, well, we've got the GDPR, which we've been laboring over for the last six months or so uh, in terms of uh, compliance and so on and so forth. Well, it's not necessarily the case that that is actually fit for purpose in the AI age. And that certainly is something that we discussed uh, and I think will continue um, to be discussed and of course building trust again in terms of how data is held whether by data trusts or hubs of all things or whatever it may be we've got to keep developing those instruments to make sure uh, that we retain public trust and they feel uh, that they have control over their data we didn't like to use the word own because we don't think that is particularly literate in the context uh, of data but certainly control um, is a concept that is perfectly legitimate. And as part of that, um, we really wanted to make sure that SMEs had access to the data sets they need in order to develop uh, 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 their AI applications uh, so that, uh, you know, if they're denied that, machine learning obviously uses a huge amount of data uh, uh, when you're developing AI and algorithms and so on. But uh, if you don't have access to it because it's monopolized by the big tech companies, uh, then there's something wrong there, and that is stifling competition. So uh, we did say that we thought the Competition and Markets Authority uh, should take a look at that and make sure uh, that going forward that those SMEs were able to develop and they had the data sets that they needed. Uh, and one of our central proposals was that there needs to be an ethical framework um, for the AI code. And it was called by one of our committee members, Lord Giddens, uh, in the Washington Post as the new Magna Carta. Of course, the first former moment when a king had to abide by the laws of the land. Uh, so we see it as that big. We don't have King John's electronic signature, but we, we want the equivalent. Um, and uh, this is because we believe that the UK is in a position to actively shape AI's development and utilisation. Um, there's already a welcome and lively debate between government, the corporate sector, and certainly, you know, some of the big uh, companies are going down this route and, and doing work of their own in this area. But we still believe that there is potential for the UK to lead at an international level to draw up 
a cross-sector AI code. And you can see that we've made our first attempt at that code up here. Um, when we understand and recognize that President Putin is currently saying whoever becomes leader in this sphere will become ruler of the world, we know that we need to start setting up some kind of code around this area. But, uh, of course, you, uh, whatever you do, even if you spend a year uh, uh, pr producing a report, uh, rather like uh, the narrative that Rob was talking about, you can't uh, g g uh, you know, get uh, uh, too sophisticated about this, especially with the Mail Online. Uh, 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 that is the summary, that is their summary of our report, take it uh, in the spirit to which it's intended, probably uh, to scare us all, uh, uh, which was certainly not our intention. Um, uh, uh, and uh, in summary, uh, we said, uh, we asked whether the UK is ready, uh, willing and able to take advantage of AI, and we said with our recommendations, it will be, but with a qualification. So, and apologies, this is quite small, but I would refer you to the report, and we see this table as very important because there's a whole plethora of organisations that have been set up by government already in existence, and each one needs to lead in a different area in order to ensure that our rewards are reaped as, a, as, a, as the UK, but also that AI is taken forward in the way that we have recommended. So all of these bodies have a particular responsibility, and strategic leadership from the government is absolutely fundamental and needs to underpin that. So yes, uh, we think we are ready, willing, and able, um, but it requires the leadership of all these bodies, uh, and nothing must fall between them. Uh, in terms of the recommendations that we've made. And just finally, to demonstrate that we're not dinosaurs in ermine, which is another uh, very good media narrative, uh, 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 Ollie and my uh, Twitter accounts, if you wish to uh, uh, retweet or do whatever you want to do, communicate uh, post uh, this session. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ollie, and thank you, Tim. Right, we've literally got 17 minutes left. Um, if anyone wants to join us for Meet the Speaker afterwards, please do come and continue the conversation. I'm going to ask you to do something really hard for politicians, and that's answer questions with brevity and precision. Oh, he's really good. So uh, let's kick things off. <laughs> Matt Hancock announced consultation yesterday. The government have to formally respond to your report in the next few days. For those of us not so familiar with the political process, what are we expecting? Will they just ignore it all? Will they adopt it all? What's going to be the likely uh, uh, gains we'll get from this? Well, I was quite heartened. And now, you know, let's not um, uh, bank on too much, but I was quite heartened by the very first DCMS question time. Uh, Matt Hancock was asked uh, what he thought of our report, and he may not have read many House of Lords reports in the past, but he said this was the best report that he'd read to date. So uh, <laughs> I think we, we, we should expect, I think, at least you know, the bulk of the recommendations uh, being addressed. And, uh, you know, I, I remain optimistic. Uh, technically, he's got a few days, but when I bumped into him the other day, I sort of rather got the impression that they weren't going to quite hit the deadline. Um, and something that we were very, very cautious about in terms of our committee recommendations was not reinventing the wheel, not trying to create some kind of new institute or body that didn't currently exist. It was more about working the current system. Uh, so making it easier for government to adopt our recommendations. Okay, so let's get through, through a few things. I mean, you mentioned Russia, you mentioned China. I mean, are we fooling ourselves? So if you think about the rhetoric we've had so far, from a few months ago, the government was saying, we're going to be the leader of AI. Following your report, we're now saying we're going to be the ethical leader of AI. There's going to be many people in this room that have been to China and been to the US. In this sheer scale of the endeavor and the ambition here, uh, in one city in China, they're planning to invest a huge amount of money to train 150,000 AI practitioners. Is this too little, too late, and are we deluding ourselves with this uh, ambition? Well, we are quite late when it comes to uh, what China is doing in this field, um, you know, in places like Xinjiang and so on. But uh, I've had quite a lot of interest, not only from Chinese academics, but also Chinese officials, because there is an issue. Uh, if you uh, just simply have a totally different culture of privacy uh, in a place like China, and you collect data, and you use data sets for the development of AI, and then people like Tencent or Alibaba then wish to deploy what they have developed uh, in the West, they're going to come up against problems. So we do have to have a common ethical culture, and I think that is beginning 
beginning to be recognised. Now, just how far the pennies dropped, I'm not sure. But I do know that places like the Middle East and Saudi, UAE, uh, and of course in the wider Western world in terms of Canada and Germany and so on, there's a very strong understanding that we do need to uh, actually get an ethical framework which is agreed um, together. Now, what Mr. Trump thinks of it, since he doesn't believe in rule-based uh, 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 organisations or whatever, uh, I don't know, but uh, he may be the odd one out. Ollie, did you Nothing agree with that? I'm happy with the brevity of that answer. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, th there's a risk, of course, with it moving so fast. This report now is, uh, is good for today, but are we going to be able to keep uh, adapting this? And this uh, select committee is only a temporary uh, thing. Do we need a standing committee that can move with agility to keep a pace with all these changes? Well, uh, what we looked at quite a lot was whether you have a specific AI body. But what we recognised was there's already organisations like the, the uh, Information Commissioner's Office, which needs to be you know, kind of adequately resourced, uh, the mergers um, commission authority, you know, so there, there, are, there are bodies in existence, that, but they need additional resource in order to, you know, kind of inquire into uh, monopolization of data and that kind of area. So uh, we, we believe it is, um, it is current for now. Um, should there be a separate committee? No, because it cuts across so many different areas. AI is all-encompassing, and therefore AI needs to be adopted and understood across all departmental areas. Mm -hmm. So you can't, you can't have a specific department. And the challenge is going to be, because there are so many bodies, the way that uh, Ollie was talking, there are so many uh, bodies uh, trying to make sure they're coordinated and also held to account, parliamentary account, is going to be one of the challenges. So I think setting up, we thought setting up specific bodies really wasn't the way forward. And no AI minister either, like the UAE. <laughs> Uh, no, I, no, I, and, and of course people don't uh, quite understand, he's a relatively junior minister, I mean, I, he's a minister of state, um, uh, uh, and Matt Hancock likes to regard himself as the AI minister, and actually, uh, between you and these four walls, he's not doing a bad job of it at the moment. I'm sure you're pleased to hear that. Um, jobs, education, reskilling, always one of these subjects that comes up is red hot, and we've got some different views in the room from friendly faces I can see here. Again, we've got some, a few hundred PhDs, we've got some master's students, we're talking about throwing a little bit more money into the higher education system and the school system. We're talking about the concept of lifelong learning with a, a bit of government intervention here. But if you think about the possible disruption to come, again, is this simply just a nod to this substantial endeavor we have to embark upon now? Or do you genuinely think that the the sector deal is uh, making sufficient announcements off the back of this, or we've got a far longer way to go here yet. I don't know whether Ollie wants to answer this, but my, uh, I mean, the sector deal was really just to start. I mean, I don't think the sector deal, well, the sector deal was probably written uh, last year, and well before we uh, 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 produced our report. So what I would like to see is sector deal mark two, which brings on board many of the kind of opportunity recommendations we made, um, and also uh, uh, brings together some of the uh, issues like how is the office uh, for AI, the government office for AI going to operate? How is the council, uh, the AI council going to operate? I think there's an awful lot more. Uh, you know, I certainly don't think uh, 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 we're at any point where we can be satisfied that we've got enough action. Uh, and particularly in the education area where, uh, I mean, Ollie uh, uh, has young children and quite frankly, uh, we are absolutely in the foothills on that. And I chair a university and we aren't anywhere uh, in terms of use of AI for our students for a more personalised education, which is going to be the future. Yeah, I mean, I think the only... Th the only thing that I would say is that we all came to the committee with an assumption that the curriculum wasn't up to, up to standard. And actually, the curriculum is. Uh, it's not too bad on this front, particularly at Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. Uh, but the teachers and their confidence in this area, and that also ties into the chart that you saw about public awareness overall, parental understanding of how much their children need to learn in this area is very, very poor. And I think that comes down to government and awareness issues. Because uh, most parents don't understand that their children age five and six 
need to start learning and understanding this area. But as I said in the introduction, it is the breadth of their knowledge as well that's absolutely critical. If you don't have great artists, if you don't have people with creative thinking, you're not going to get great development of AI in the future. Can I just add one? I, that's absolutely fundamental. The fact that you know we shouldn't just be herring down the road where we're saying more money for mass teaching, more money for computer science, uh, more money uh, uh, for everything to do with coding. Creative skills, the humanities uh, included, are going to be in incredibly important in the yeah. future in terms of uh, how do we deploy AI creatively. Okay, great. So we're on the ethics stage. Uh, we, we have to speak to this AI code you proposed here. Uh, it's become a bit in, in vogue now, hasn't it, these uh, AI ethical principles? And we've had Google's announced recently, Microsoft's been talking about this a lot. What do, we, what do we do to ensure these lofty ideals don't just sit on the shelf collecting dust in the years ahead? Um, do you think that the, uh, the, the Centre for Data Ethics is going to take a grip of this and start uh, developing this further? And, and of course, they're incredibly high level. Uh, that the concept here is, well, how do we, we, we can make these sort of uh, statements about benefiting humanity, but can we say we're going to benefit all of humanity with this, or is there winners and losers in this race? Ollie, do you want to speak to that? Well, at the moment, that's the problem. There are losers. There are people who are data poor. So I'm working on something which is about um, credit worthiness for people who pay rent, currently pay rent, um, because everyone who currently pays rent in the UK is assumed to be a risk when it comes to borrowing money to buy a washing machine. Well, that's ridiculous given the number of, you know, but there are, there are all sorts of reasons. So that's, a, you know, kind of an example of where people uh, are pushed into uh, data poverty, and that is evidence that we took in the committee, um, because they're not part of the, uh, the data, they're not connected. So yes, there is, it currently exists, therefore it's not about, it's not about um, that being a problem in the future, it's a problem here and now, and therefore ethics is incredibly important um, to underline this. Now what we do put in, and when we first considered it, I personally thought you know, kind of, is this, is this sufficiently um, urgent and ambitious? But I think it is. And that's about us convening a, a global summit by the end of 2019. It's always good to have these deadlines of trying to get together a wealth of people uh, to come up with uh, a code uh, and an ethical code. I think also what has often worked in the past, and this is very noticeable in the main area that I specialize in, which is nothing to do with AI, which is about housing and homelessness, is that if, if regulators, if legislators, if politicians start talking about these areas, it is amazing how, how quickly sometimes the corporate sector will get in behind it and start doing the stuff without having to have regulation. And that is why we were like touch on regulation with regard to this, because it is about you set a deadline, you try and introduce this kind of thing. And also, we've been greatly helped by the GDPR in this area. Um, uh, you, you set a deadline um, and often uh, the corporate world will get in behind it and understand it and adopt it before that deadline of regulation. And basically, business has pushed back very little on the ethical side. They've pushed back a little bit on the explainability side, um, but they haven't pushed back on this. And by the same token, internationally, we've had a huge amount of interest. I mean, you know, from Canada and Germany uh, and the UAE, who are, you know, saying that's really interesting. Yes, uh, and many of them, I mean, the Canadians are already convening uh, gatherings on, on uh, uh, ethics for AI. Uh, there are many other initiatives, almost too many initiatives um, to get your arms around. But I hope that at the end of the day, because of the enthusiasm, that we will find there is a sort of single channel that we can all agree on. Okay, good. Um, five minutes left. Uh, I'm going to take one or two questions from the floor. Um, so if there's a roving mic, um, oh, he's got a blue card. That sounds like the... <laughs> Not the red card. Good. Yeah, yeah, you, exactly. You about leadership. Sorry, we've got a mic coming over here. <laughs> Hello. Uh, you've talked about leadership, and, and clearly informed leadership is required. Um, it's an excellent report. I'm sure you've learnt an enormous amount in the preparation of it about AI. How educated an expert do you think your colleagues, both in the Lords and the Commons, and indeed the civil service are, uh, for the tasks they have ahead? 
we're a fairly small band, actually. But, um, uh, of course, as well as the select committee, I set up an all-party group uh, uh, a couple of years ago, um, which has almost created a kind of community of people who are clustered around the sort of public policy aspects of AI. And I found that uh, fantastic, actually, in terms of, you know, uh, taking the agenda forward, uh, discussing particular issues in some depth. So I, I do think that there is an education uh, aspect to it. We have too few parliamentarians who really understand, uh, you know, what's going on. But we we are a growing band, and I, uh, you know, so I have some optimism. And our committee, I can't tell you when you've got people like uh, Ollie, you've got people like David Putnam, Joan Bakewell, Anthony Giddens. Matt uh, Ridley, uh, 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 Kate Rock, you've got some very high quality people. So actually, we've got some communicators out there um, who can spread the word at the same time. Uh, question at the front here, please. Um, you mentioned a, an issue of teachers and parents maybe not recognizing the importance of children being um, well educated. How do we um, address the issue of um, the leaders not being necessarily native in the language that they're trying to teach? Uh, sorry, I don't entirely understand. I'm so sorry. So is, that, is that digital literacy of the senior executives in companies? or? Are you talking about teachers having digital understanding? Um, or parents? So or? the areas of leadership that you mentioned um, earlier in your report, I was wondering yeah. um, how do we d address the issue that sometimes the actual... Um, issues that need to be led on. Um, on oh, the on leaders the don't have an understanding. Okay, yes. Um, so, yeah, that's absolutely critical, and that's why um, I talked about the need for strategic leadership in this. So, it may be that Theresa May hasn't got a scooby-doo about AI, um, but she's actually made a speech in Davos on it, um, and that is because... <coughs> Uh, people um, have, have briefed her on it, you know, she's used departmental knowledge, and that is what you do as Prime Minister. But then what is required from the politician always in this area is, is strategic leadership at critical moments. You know, this is, a, this is a growing, fantastic sector in the UK, mostly at start-up level. There's a real critical issue about risk and investment you know, on the, on the scale of Silicon Valley that we're missing, and there are recommendations within the report about that, and that is the moment when government needs to intervene, so in that area. Government also needs to intervene uh, because teachers lack the confidence to teach children in this area. So it's all there in the curriculum, there's a lot in the curriculum, but what they don't have, teachers, individual teachers, is the confidence to teach this because they themselves are running slightly behind. So then, it requires political leadership, and political leadership, you don't need to be able to code in order to um, provide political leadership, but you need to understand this is an industry that needs help, and this is an education system that needs help. I'm hoping that answers your question. Very good, okay, final minutes. Who's got the hardest question? <laughs> Who's looking at That's it? for Tim. <laughs> Actually, could you quickly both ask it? Hard question, seconds. what One. are you going to cut? Um, my children work longer hours than I do. Anything you want to do to make, get them digitally, digitally literate, doing AI, etc., okay. means another subject has to go. A girl in the UK will get over 300 hours of RS before she gives up computing, because nearly all... Okay, do. great question. Quickly, uh, last 30 seconds. Um, if you feel like businesses tend to fall in line without regulation, what, in reality, would the government what would you recommend the government do when they don't fall in line? As um, we all know that businesses don't always follow tax regulations, for example. What if they didn't follow your recommendations? Yeah. Okay, great. First. Ollie, AI. quickly on uh, what we're going to cut from the curriculum. Okay. Um, if we have to. Uh, what do we cut from the curriculum? Um, I think it's more... Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a school governor, I'm a parent, so I feel your pain, um, and I deal with this on a regular basis. Um, and it's about... I'm going to slightly not answer your question. I'm going to say that the challenge, I think, for us as governors of schools at the moment is how you raise a whole balanced human being so that they are ready for the massive, massive challenges that are ahead of them. And therefore, what I would introduce, say, you know, at Key Stage 1 at the school, the state school that I'm a, um, a governor of, we include philosophy. Why do we include that? Because children need to learn critical thinking and critical skills so that they don't 
fall prey in a way to social media when they're older. I'm sorry, I, that's a very yeah. simplified version. If you'd like to join us for a quick Q&A afterwards, I've got an angry very happy screen in front of me, uh, very sorry. quickly on regulation. Sorry. Sorry. Quickly on yeah. regulation. We deliberately uh, did not go down the um, regulation path saying we've got to regulate AI, we've got to have an AI regulator. That's why we set the ethical framework. But of course, if people's behavior, if b business behavior, if government behavior and so on doesn't uh, uh, conform to the ethical framework, then of course that's the time to start considering regulation and for instance, you know, there are certain areas like automated cars, autonomous cars, where already legislation is being put into effect. So as the issues present themselves, that's the time to regulate, I think, and we thought, rather than simply saying, let's regulate in advance of anything happening, um, uh, because that we think that stifles innovation. Very good. And on that note, I'm afraid our time's up. If you'd like to join us in thanking Tim and Ollie.